I'm Laura Trevallion in New York City, and this is BBC World News America. The president and the pontiff, Joe Biden, meets Pope Francis ahead of this weekend's G20 summit. It's a whirlwind diplomatic tour for the US leader. The motorcades will be sweeping through Rome this weekend, through Glasgow next week. World leaders tasked with saving the planet. So no big deal then. In the Afghan city of Jalalabad, there's a deadly battle for supremacy between the Taliban and a branch of Islamic State. And a story with Sol, the nine-year-old whose grandfather inspired his passion for northern soul dancing. I've seen some clips online of people dance to it. I'll give it a try and um, I'm rather good at it. Welcome to World News America on PBS and around the globe. President Biden met the Pope in Rome today at the start of his second major foreign trip. He also met the French president to try and repair frayed relations. It's a busy few days for President Biden. Leaders from G20 countries meet in Rome tomorrow and the UN Climate Summit begins in Glasgow on Sunday. As Mr Biden is on the world stage, the fate of his ambitious domestic agenda is still in the balance. The BBC's John Sopel is travelling with the US president and sent this report. The ruler of the world's preeminent superpower en route to meet the world's most powerful religious leader. But for Joe Biden, only America's second Roman Catholic president, this is an audience with his spiritual guide and clearly someone he admires enormously. You are the most significant warrior for peace I've ever met. And with your permission, I'd like to be able to give you a coin. I know my son would want me to give this to you. The president gave him a coin as a gift and then joked about his Irish heritage. I'm the only Irishman you've ever met who's never had a drink. <laughs> and the Pope chose the BBC today, in particular thought for the day on Radio 4, to deliver a firm message to the political elite ahead of next week's crucial COP26 summit. The political decision makers who will meet at COP26 in Glasgow are urgently summoned to provide effective responses to the present ecological crisis and in this way to offer concrete hope to future generations. Joe Biden agrees with the Pope about the urgency, but will words be matched by actions? The motorcades will be sweeping through Rome this weekend, through Glasgow next week world leaders tasked with saving the planet. So no big deal then. Around the world there have been protests of varying size to chivy world leaders into action. This was the scene in Tel Aviv today. In Glasgow outside where the summit will be held next week, the demonstrators seem to be outnumbered by security guards. And in London, Greta Thunberg was the star attraction. She's buried somewhere in this mob of photographers. And she had this message for President Biden. When you are a leader of, of the most powerful country in the world, then you have lots of responsibility. And when the US is actually, in fact, in, like, expanding fossil fuel infrastructure, that is a clear sign that they are not really treating the climate crisis as an emergency. And this salvo to other nations from the former California governor and Terminator star. All of those countries that come and give speeches, this, we are not going to go and lose jobs because of this going green and all this. They're liars. They, or they're just stupid and they don't know how to do it. Joe Biden on this trip to Europe wants to show that America is leading the world on tackling climate change. But his 85 vehicle convoy, most of which were flown in from the US, may not be leading by example, or in this holy city, practicing what you preach. John Sopel joins us now from Rome. John, President Biden also met President Emmanuel Macron today. Was that a bit of bridge building going on there? Yes, it was. And Laura, just before you queued over to me, I was reading a joint statement that's been issued uh, by President Macron and President Biden. I just want to read you one sentence because it's delicious. Uh, they share a commitment to systematic and in-depth consultation and coordination to ensure transparency. 
that is not what happened over this AUKUS deal between Australia, the UK and the United States, which resulted in the French losing some $60 billion worth of uh, submarine contracts, which left the French absolutely seething and they withdrew their ambassador from Washington. So when you have uh, them agreeing to increase coordination and transparency, that is Macron poking Joe Biden in the eye. Most certainly is. And John, what about President Biden's domestic agenda? Is that overshadowing his trip as he tries to showcase American leadership? Well, we're hearing a framework agreement. That's what he's saying. Um, if you kind of just pick that apart slightly, will you realise it's not actually an agreement and it's certainly not a law that has yet been passed in terms of this $1.75 trillion uh, that Joe Biden wants to put into infrastructure in, into the US and, of course, for the environment as well. And... Um, I think that those domestic travails go with him. So he had something when he got on the plane at Air Force One. Was it what he wanted completely? No, a long way short. But I think he will say to other world leaders, this is America's statement of intent. This is what we will do. And I suppose that will give him a little bit of leadership kudos when he's here in Rome this weekend and in Glasgow next week. John Sopel in Rome, thank you. Well, as world leaders prepare to meet in Rome, as John was saying, there's pressure for rich nations to share vaccines with less developed countries. Here in the U.S., the Food and Drug Administration has just approved the use of Pfizer's vaccine for children aged 5 to 12. More than two-thirds of the vaccines that have gone into arms globally have been administered in wealthy countries. Courtney Bembridge reports. As the first leaders arrived in Rome for a meeting of the world's major economies, pressure is mounting for them to hand over stockpiled vaccines. Together, these countries have the ability to make the political and financial commitments that are needed to end this pandemic and to prevent future crises. We are at a decisive moment requiring decisive leadership. It's claimed hundreds of millions of vaccines will soon go to waste because they'll expire before they can be used in the countries that bought them, including Britain, the United States, Canada and the EU. A group of former world leaders led by the former UK Prime Minister Gordon Brown has released an open letter calling for the extra doses to be immediately sent to where they're most needed, in Africa, Latin America and Asia. Vaccines are going to go to waste while people are, are literally dying and getting extremely ill in developing countries because they can't get access to them. So there needs to be a very quick response now by high-income countries to get the surplus doses out there. Indonesia's President Joko Widodo has spoken exclusively to the BBC and echoed calls for a fairer distribution. I see that everyone has helped, but in my opinion, it's not enough not just for Indonesia, but for all developing countries, and especially for poor countries. Global coronavirus cases are rising for the first time in two months, and there are now more than 10,000 deaths a day being recorded worldwide. Advocates say many of them could be avoided with a fairer vaccine distribution model. Courtney Bembridge, BBC News. Well, you heard Courtney talking there about the dire need for vaccines in Africa. Across the continent, less than 5% of the population has been fully vaccinated. In fact, only 15 countries in Africa out of 50 had jabbed 10% of their populations by the end of September, as represented by the countries shaded on the map and the island states that are named. That 10% was the WHO's target. And the problem comes down to supply. Africa relies heavily on COVAX, the global vaccine sharing program. But COVAX just revised down the number of doses it aims to deliver by the end of the year. For more, we're joined now from Cape Town by Petro Turblanche, the managing director of Afrigen, a pharmaceutical startup in South Africa working with the World Health Organization to develop their own mRNA vaccines. Welcome to the program, Petro. This is incredible work that you're doing. How long until you can have a COVID vaccine for Africa, do you think? Thank you and greetings from a beautiful summer South African evening. 
Um, depending on whether we have access to technology, the timelines um, can be short or quite long. Um, the team scientists in South Africa, under the guidance and support of WHO, have started the production forward integration and um, uh, production of a vaccine that is based, based on a sequence, which is one of our best vaccines available to the population at the moment, and that's the Moderna vaccine. If you have access to critical information, this could be done in 12 to 14 months, if not, the timelines are longer. OK, so Petro, is Moderna going to share its vaccine recipe with you? They did get about a billion dollars of U.S. taxpayer money, so they should, it's being argued here, by U.S. lawmakers. These discussions are complex. They are ongoing. Um, they are, there are many factors that influence the decision of companies to share technology. Uh, we are hope that there will be critical support, technical support to the teams in South Africa who has the capability to produce these vaccines. We require support around the quality control procedures and ultimately regulatory procedures because that is what will slow us down. Uh, we know the sequences. We have teams that worked on RNA for 10 years, although for therapeutic applications, similar to what Moderna has done in its early days, we're now looking at making a vaccine. But we need technical support. What could this mean for Africa if you're successful? So we will never, ever want to be in this very uncomfortable reality we have we've been in now. The purpose of this mRNA hub, which is the global hub uh, created by WHO and partners, is to establish capacity and capability on the continent to produce our own vaccines. This particular hub focuses on mRNA platform. We will build the skills and capacity, transfer that knowledge to different <coughs> spokes <coughs> across the continent to ensure that we build sufficient capacity to produce for future epidemics, but also in the medium and, and, and long-term vaccines for this continent and for other low and middle income countries. There is no manufacturing capacity for, for COVID-19 vaccines in low and middle income countries. That cannot be sustained. We have to change that. And part of this model yeah. is to do exactly that. Petro Turblanche, thank you so much for joining us from South Africa. Well, we go to Afghanistan now, where U.S. officials are warning that an offshoot of Islamic State could be able to launch attacks abroad six months from now. The Taliban insists they won't let that happen. Two groups of fierce rivals. IS is much smaller than the Taliban and accuses them of not being hardline enough. In the east of the country, a murky and bloody conflict is escalating between the two sides. Sekunder Kamani and cameraman Malik Mudassir report from Jalalabad. A new chapter is beginning in this conflict. We've come to its front line. The Taliban now rule the country. But here in Jalalabad, they're facing an almost daily stream of targeted attacks by the local branch of the Islamic State group. This, a roadside bombing. The hit-and-run tactics of the Taliban now used against them. It's not just the Taliban who are under attack. Abdul Rahman Marwin was a prominent social activist. His two young sons saw him gunned down earlier this month. When the Taliban took power, we were hopeful that all the violence and killing would finally stop. But now we face this new phenomenon with the name of IS. The Taliban's intelligence service has detained dozens of alleged IS members. Hundreds escaped from prison during the group's takeover. Dead bodies with notes labelling them IS fighters are dumped by the road every few days. But the Taliban won't admit responsibility for the extrajudicial killings. They accuse IS of being extremists. IS accuse the Taliban of not being radical enough. There are almost daily attacks in Jalalabad, it seems. Are you really in control of the situation here? Just as we defeated international forces on the battlefield with the blessing of Allah, we tell the world not to worry about any small group of traitors carrying out attacks here. They will be defeated too. 
IS has been launching attacks for years, but they've spread to new parts of the country since the Taliban came to power. This, a twin suicide bombing on a Shia mosque in the Taliban stronghold of Kandahar. The group don't control any territory, but they have deadly cells, particularly here in Jalalabad. IS is much less powerful than the Taliban, but the attacks they're carrying out here are causing real concern, both for Afghans exhausted by bloodshed and internationally. American officials warn IS could launch foreign operations in as little as six months that lacks capacity. They issued threats to the whole world. They wanted to establish their rule everywhere. But those are just words. They are not powerful enough to take over Afghanistan. The Taliban have increased security around eastern Afghanistan. Publicly, they're playing down the threat from IS. But many fear more violence lies ahead. Sekanda Kamani, BBC News, Jalalabad. A disturbing development there in Afghanistan. In other news now from around the world, Buckingham Palace says Queen Elizabeth will continue to rest for at least the next two weeks following doctor's advice. During that time, the Queen, who's 95, will continue to undertake light duties but will not make any official visits. She's already had to pull out of a trip to the climate change conference in Glasgow. Poland's parliament has approved a law to build a wall along part of its border with Belarus to stop migrants from crossing illegally. It will cost more than $400 million and critics say it won't work. Several Eastern European countries have seen a surge in migrants, mostly from the Middle East. Pakistan's security forces have warned Islamist demonstrators not to continue advancing towards the capital, Islamabad. The crowd are from a banned movement with a history of violence. Their rally began last week with demands including the release of their leader and the expulsion of France's ambassador over cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad, published by a French satirical magazine. Puneet Rajkumar, a prominent film actor from southern India, has died from a heart attack at the age of 46. He worked on more than 29 films and won the National Award for the Best Child Artist earlier in his career. There's been an outpouring of grief among his fans in front of his house. You're watching BBC World News America, still to come on tonight's programme. Protesters against the military coup in Sudan tell the BBC soldiers fired right at them as the UN appeals for calm ahead of more protests planned for tomorrow. Archaeologists digging on the route of a new high-speed railway in England have unearthed what they're calling an astounding set of Roman statues. The pieces are thought to be at least 1,000 years old. Simon Jones reports for us now on this discovery. A dig with a difference. Unearthing statues described as rare, remarkable, incredible. The head and shoulders of a woman, a bust of a man, plus the head from a statue of a child. In such good condition that archaeologists say it's like looking into the faces of the past. The team that found them can't disguise their excitement or the smiles on their faces. Pretty much a giant grin. Um, everybody was really, really astounded to find them. They're just so unusual and so well preserved as well. We may never know who these people actually were, but the hope is the statues will eventually go on display, the first time they'll have been seen in public for more than a thousand years. Simon Jones. BBC News. On Monday, there was a military coup in Sudan, and now the leader of that coup is under pressure to give power back to civilians. There's another protest march in Sudan tomorrow. The BBC has met protesters who were injured this week as they denounced the coup. The army has denied using live ammunition against the demonstrators. Mohamed Osman reports from Khartoum. Mohayed was hit by a bullet. The university student was among protesters who gathered outside the army headquarters in Khartoum to denounce the military coup. He says the scene turned deadly in minutes. I was shot along with at least seven or eight other people around me. People took some of us into their homes to help with the injuries. Others died on the spot. They took me and other protesters to this hospital. 
Amin also recalls the moment he thought he would die. He says that army soldiers beat him with sharp objects. He hit me with a metal bar in my stomach. I started to spit out blood, but was rescued and brought to this hospital. They are not alone. Since Sudan's military seized power from a transitional government, the protests has seen bloody scenes. The injured in hospitals confirm the levels of violence by military soldiers against people who had gathered on the streets. There are scores of people who were killed and injured in different parts of the country. But the army insists those in Khurtum hospitals were not shot by soldiers. There was no shooting by soldiers. The army is part of the Sudanese people. These are all lies, and those who spread it want to twist the facts to serve their own bad intentions. Young protesters are clearly not convinced and unfazed. They continue to flood the streets. This is a country that saw a popular uprising just three years ago. It overthrew another military figure, Omar al-Bashir. The people here are sending a message. They can't afford to have the country go back to the old days. Mohammed Mohammed Uthman, BBC News, Khartoum. And that coup in Sudan is now almost a week old. Grandchildren can learn a lot from their grandparents, as we all know. And in the case of nine-year-old Charlie in the UK, his grandfather inspired him to take up northern soul dancing. DJs at clubs in northern England played the music in the 70s, which is how Charlie's grandfather became such a fan. And now Charlie's been to his first real soul night. Here's how he got on. My mum thinks I'm going to wear myself out in like the, four, uh, the first four seconds and I'm going to be coming back for a drink every ten minutes. But aye, aye. that's what I'm all going to say. Aye, aye. I'm Charlie and I like to dance to Northern Soul. The first one I've ever been to this is, and um, just said to my dad, um, I feel like if I do this right and I take it serious, I'm going to get invited to another one. I'm Scott and I'm Charlie's dad. I've always listened to the music, uh, started watching a few of the clips on YouTube and other stations. It's got well into it, really. So I've seen some clips online of people dancing to it. I'll give it a try, and um, I'm rather good at it. I am Chalky. Basically, my co-promoter, Ian Garrett, he sent me a video of young Charlie, he's age nine. A lot of people ask me, what's the future for Northern Soul? People like Charlie, we've got a future. You know, he's age nine. His granddad got him into Northern Soul, and it's absolutely fantastic to have him at a venue like tonight with real Northern Soul people. I'm Carl, I'm Ch uh, Charlie's granddad. He's the soul of me art, like you know. He, he, I've seen when I used to do it years ago when I was about 18, 19. He's moved on now, and it's exactly the same. He used to do it when he was, I think, younger. He used to go from place to place. I used to go on the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I'd be back at work on the Monday, so on the Sundays it used to it had to be a, a quick one. He's really influenced me trying in um, doing Northern Soul really. Charlie showing off his considerable moves. Now before we go tonight, it's Halloween this weekend. And here in New York City, there are ghoulish decorations everywhere. The American enthusiasm for trick-or-treating has spread beyond our borders. Just ask the Belgians. In fact, in this Belgian zoo, it's the furry animals who are getting the pumpkins. Lions, buffaloes, rhinos, you name it, they're getting in the Halloween spirit. This zoo in Antwerp is the oldest animal park in Belgium. And with 5,000 animals, that's a lot of pumpkins. Happy Halloween to our four-legged friends, and I'm very much looking forward to giving out candy on my stoop in Brooklyn. I'm Laura Trevelyan. Thank you so much for watching BBC World News America. Have a good weekend, and happy Halloween.
Hello there. This weekend we should see the rain easing in the south of Italy. Of course, we've had uh, huge amounts of rain in Sicily and Calabria, and that of course has brought some flooding. The